Are we good then? Okay, we're going? Okay. Um, thank you all for coming out to the talk. What? Oh, yeah, that's actually, right. Actually, uh, yeah, okay. I have an important announcement to make before we introduce uh, aesthetics here. Um, actually, after this talk, uh, the actors from Two Girls, One Cup uh, are hosting a DVD signing uh, out in the, uh, the vending area. And they'll be selling Baby Ruth bars to raise money for mental health awareness. So uh, please join Nauticon in our effort to support Brazil. Uh, anyways, our next speaker has no clue what he's talking about, so uh, don't listen to him. In fact, if you want to retain your dignity and self-respect, there's the door. Get up and leave. So, <laughs> welcome. All right, so thanks for the introduction. Um, are you guys enjoying Nauticon? Hell fucking yeah! Is this anyone's first time? Cool. Can we have a round of applause for Tiger and uh, Froggy? Was that on video? Good. I just wanted people applauding for the swastika on video. <laughs> okay, so this talk is uh, how to win, what is it, how to give talks and influence organizers based loosely on Dale Carnegie's how to win friends and influence people. Can anyone tell me what the nature of the swastika was before it was a Nazi symbol? A sign from India? Yeah, it, it was all over the world. It was used in a lot of different areas. It actually used to be a symbol of good luck. Uh, it was a postcard from 1906. And this token here is actually from uh, John Deere. And if you look even deeper into it, it, as it was considered a holy symbol, predated in the cross by about 4,000 years. Before fascism, it was used all over the place. It was used by the Boy Scouts. There was actually an emblem, a Khmer badge. It was uh, touted in the side of a Boy Scout handbook, and if you see on the side here, this is actually an advertisement from Coca-Cola. So the swastika was used all over the place. It has a very fascinating background in history. And if you want to look into the nature of how the swastika evolved in time and precisely why Hitler used it to emblemize the Nazis, it's very fascinating and it actually drives to the core about what propaganda is. So who am I? I am currently living in San Francisco, California. And I have given numerous talks at Nauticon in the past, including the Temporary Autonomous Zone, which is about the rave scene, and Zen and the Art of the Turing Machine, which was uh, some people last year tried to heckle me during that talk, but I think I got them back. There they are right there. I think they're... What? Oh, the Temporary Autonomous Zone is the principle the rave scene was built upon. What? It's, well, let me rephrase. Burn-in man comes from the Temporary Autonomous Zone. That's a better way to put it. So, was that a schmoo ball? Okay, so I was also involved with the Open AMD effort, the AMD project at the Last Hope Conference, which was the RFID tracking badge. And I actually have a story about that which kind of delves into the heart of this talk. Uh, specifically, it showed up on Slashdot and Boing Boing several times, and there was a reason that happened. Basically, we were trying to figure out a good way to publicize it, because Slashdot isn't just going to take anything, no matter how cool it is. And if something has multiple sources already backing it up, then it's more likely to get accepted. So being a fan of Boing Boing, which I try to read on the regular, Cory Doctorow was given a book signing in New York at Union Square. So having just read his book, Little Brother, which actually deals with some of the topics in this as far as um, evading oversight and security go, I decided to go and meet Cory Doctorow because I'd never met him before. So I took the book, got it signed by him, and mentioned like a five or ten words about the project that we were doing at Hope. Turned out that not only did he know what 2600 was, but he'd already written for it, so he was totally game for it. So um, I had a little email exchange with him, and from then on, every announcement that we wanted to get done for Hope, I was able to submit it to Boing Boing, and we got it up. Now, because we had some things in Boing Boing already regarding the RFID stuff, when we submitted, to the sl when we submitted it to Slashdot, Slashdot looked at these other links and they say, oh, well, okay, it's already on Boing Boing and Boing Boing is an accredited source, so we might as well put it up. And that's really how a lot of the publicity for Hope got out there. So I'm also involved with a hackerspace called Noisebridge in San Francisco. Yeah, and Mitch is one of the board members and founders up here, and Noisebridge is doing some cool stuff. And there is some representation here at the conference. So, attention. 
What is attention? How do you keep people's attention? I have a way to keep people's attention up here. <laughs> so, indeed, indeed. So, can anybody give me some examples of short-term versus long-term attention spans? How do you capture people's imagination and attention? Anybody want a Red Bull? <laughs> you don't want to see my boobs. Okay. Anybody? Uh, you want a cup of? Should I toss this? Shiny things, okay. Well, hold on. Give me an example first. Why is Twitter short-term attention span? Why, why does it cater to people's short-term attention span? It's because I only see them once in a while. You don't, okay, fair enough, that works. Twitter also responds to instantaneity and immediate response. It's, they call it microblogging, but it's really a bunch of immediate status updates. So information denial is another very interesting element. Does anybody recognize this scene? Okay. How did that captivate the public's attention? No, 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 because you can solve that in a single episode, right? Like I can have one episode and next week you find out what happened next but they actually spanned this out over the course of a season. Or over, what's that? <laughs> so this is actually very fascinating to watch because you have every piece except the one critical element of the puzzle. And then within, what was it, six months or a year, I can't remember how long it was, in circa early 90s, like 92, it was ultimately answered and resolved. However, until that resolvement happened, people were wondering what the hell was going on. Emotion is another way that you can try to uh, capture people's attention, both with uh, sensory overload and underload and trigger and sympathy and what cool is. Convincing people that something is cool, and we'll get to that in a second. So, when you look at this, what do you think? Why is this considered complex? Somebody answer this. Okay, fucking up design, lots of words. Lots gets into something. What do you see when you look at this? Different colors. Does this make you want to jump out and buy a Shasta Cola? What the hell is a Shasta Cola? We don't know. But the coupon is blue, Okay. The coupon definitely is an iPad. Okay, so the coupon. Okay, so one element of that even... You get a Red Bull for that. So one element of this is even eye-catching at all. It's, it's a clusterfuck of imagery. It's way, there's just too much going on for people that pay attention to something like, uh, like Twitter. Now... Look at something simple. You have three selections here. You have Coke, Diet Coke, and Sprite. Why is this successful? Anyone? Only three options. It's a symbol, right? More so, you have the primary drink, which is Coke, and then you have the sort of secondary drink, which is Diet Coke, and then the strange outlier, in case you don't like Coke, you can have Sprite. That's psychologically how this stuff works. Now, why is this better than Shasta? Why is this a better... Some people have never even heard of Shasta. Why is Shasta... Hmm? No, Shasta, not Shaisa. We're not in Germany. Well, it's... Uh, it's not the spelling, although that gets into uh, some interesting elements that we can look at. The human psyche can only hold about five ideas at once before kind of falling apart. So when you get into a drink like Shasta Cola, which has something like 30 clusterfuck flavors, and you look at this, oh, I can pick one of these easy. People don't like it when you give them choices. You like, people like it when you make the choices for them and give them something. So here's another example. We have a McDonald's menu. This is a super clusterfuck of, I, I can't even read this. The, the text is so small. There's what? Yeah, but how can you make it better? You can make it better. Pictures. Pictures, like that. That's easy, right? It's just one thing, it's an advertisement, it separates it out from everything else. I know that if I want to get this, where I can go, right? I know what's in it. India, yeah. That's the... <laughs> Let's go to the next topic here, sympathy. Why, why, why does this matter? Why, why would you use sympathy, sympathy to get something? Another Red Bull. Right, right. People have barriers built up in logic, and you have 
Sympathy, like a picture like this, implies a family unit, right? So we have this idea, this notion of what the family unit is. And if we can cater to them, if we can say, hey, if you use this kind of toilet paper or these kind of paper towels, then you're going to fit into the family. What the fuck are you doing? Damn right, yeah, you got to have a little gagger. OK. So we have this idea of the family unit, right? And it's, it, this is only one subsection of how the advertising campaigns can work. And we have a loving family with a fresh baby and everything. And we can cater certain projects or certain products to that family or using that family to other families to say that, hey, if you match this mold, then you're going to become the stereotypical family unit. And because people don't like to differ from the norm, we establish what the norm is and thus they go with it. Whereas, if you have somebody like this, does anybody hold sympathy, to sympathy towards this guy? Why? <laughs> For the record, this guy, according to Shardy, is trying to cure malaria. Yeah, Bill Gates is the man. <laughs> so, census is another angle. How can we attack the census? We what? So here's an interesting example. A bakery. What is it about a bakery or, say, a grocery store that attracts people? How, how do they use marketing? They pipe the smell out. Bingo, they pipe the smell. Supermarkets and grocery stores in general are arranged in a certain way so that when you walk in, you see, what, what, do, you, what do you see when you walk into a supermarket? What's produce. A, produce, okay. Why is produce Color. important? Color, it's white. Sure, okay. And another, this doesn't show up so well there, but another technique that is shown is motion, making something look energetic and happy. If you have this versus a regular can of Coke, People are just going to go for that because it just, it affects the psyche. Having fluid, having something that is in motion, which uh, gets into the next thing. Okay. Why is this effective advertising? Does anybody know the process by which they create images like this for advertising? Okay, there's a lot of photoshopping involved. Yeah, it's not real, and that's what actually captures the essence of this. It is not real. Generally, these are prefabricated. It might not even, it's usually not real meat if it is. It's raw meat, which is painted over, and everything here is completely fabricated to present the image of what the hamburger is. And this is what people really get. It's ugly, it's sunken <laughs> over. What's that? It still looks good. Yeah. Depends on how hungry you are, yeah. I mean, in all honesty, that looks about as good as your mom. I mean... <laughs> Hold on, we need a group consensus. Is Shardy's mom hot? Yes. I only saw three hands come up, sorry. This is why direct democracy doesn't work. Sex appeal also plays a heavy role in this. Does anybody want, would anybody want this if it weren't for the hot, like, dirty chick that's standing up there? It says the words washing on it. No, this is very effective for advertising and it appeals to people's carnal urges. According to Shardy, wash me is actually referring to the herpes. Is that your mom, by the way? So let, let's go into social groups and where this all comes from, right? What are the difference between official and unofficial leaders? Does anybody have an idea? Nobody want a Red Bull?
Okay, good. You get a Red Bull for that, sir. Thank you. To restate what uh, this man has said, official leaders are those who are designated so by title or by action to some extent. So captains, corporals, admirals, priests, pope, whatnot. And that constructs an official hierarchy. Whereas an unofficial leader is somebody who is just kind of deemed the leader either by skill or by presence and being. Or by Jaeger. Or by Jaeger. Speak. Why is this, um, why is it important to make this, dis this difference, to, to uh, recognize this difference? What's the difference between the two? Why does it matter? Anybody? Enforceability. Enforceability. Okay. How does that? Hmm? Credibility. Enforceability. Credibility. If you can't become an official leader, you become an unofficial leader. That's very... <laughs> yeah, if you can't teach, you teach, Jim. If you can't coerce people into following your will, you just win in the election. Or you, ri you rig the election. Fair enough, fair enough. I won't get too political here. This is propaganda talk. So, okay, another question. Why do family businesses die? Hold on. Hand out there. You're on Wikipedia? Wait, internet's actually working for somebody here? Yeah. Hold on, you get a Red Bull for that. Even if it's for Wikipedia, you still get that. Oh, you know, okay. Okay. It's about, yeah, right. It, it works into passion and motivation. Um, so the fact that a uh, family business has to hire a junior to do a job, whereas um, uh, another business can hire someone who's best qualified for the position. Sure. And the British royal family works into this heavily. I mean, look what happened to it, right? Look at Prince Charles. Does anybody want that guy leading them? <laughs> no. Exactly. So this falls back into community. And community can be defined by many things. Quiet in the back, please. You're disrupting the talk. You should get a Red Bull for that, actually. No, for disrupting the talk. Here you are. Come on, get it. Come on, get it. I'll set it right here. <laughs> okay, so why are these things important? Why is error specific? Error specific. Why would we cater to somebody? Why would we mold advertising and market into somebody in the 1950s differently than in the 1990s or now? Pardon? The media is, is just as important as the message. Okay. The media is just Im as important as the message. Sure. Because in all honesty, with Coke ads, for example, or uh, there's some other stuff I can get into later, but the message, retains, the, the message remains the same. It's a matter of how that message is transferred, either through societies or through different people. And based on what's in fashion at the time, that will change. And that gets into uh, the way things used to be, which is just a term citing effectively retro. Why is 80s coming back into fashion right now? Anyone? Because neon, neon is cheap. Hold oh, hand. So do we have Wikipedia on like text-to-speech, or do we just have an academic going here? Kudos. Right, right, right. Yeah, history doesn't repeat itself at rhymes. So, to get a bit more technical, we can delve into the history of that. Oh yeah, get his Red Bull for him. Bad dog. 
<laughs> so does anybody recognize these names at all? We have Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane, awesome. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. Maslow. Maslow, good, okay. Anybody, okay, this is a bunch of IT geeks. Do you know who Shannon is, Claude Shannon? Besides Shardy. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a bit. Ed Bernays is very, very important. There's actually a documentary called The Century of Self that is directed by uh, Adam, was it Adam Curtis, I believe. Ed Bernays coined the term public relations in, I want to say, the 20s, because the word propaganda actually used to mean the same thing as public relations, but propaganda went out of fashion as it was used as a word to describe what the Germans were doing to advertise their ideas during World War I. And Ed Bernays was trying to figure out a good way to get around this because we still want to communicate the same ideas, but we can't have that social stigma against it. And therefore, he coined the term public relations, and he opened up in New York City the first office of public relations. He was very, very influential. A couple of examples. In the 1920s, it was completely taboo for women to smoke. It was, it was simply out of the question, given the, the way the society was. And Lucky Strikes hired on Ed Bernays to try to reverse this, to try to make it acceptable, because really, if women are smoking, then that opens up 50% more of the, the gender, the other half. Everyone is suddenly smoking in public now. The way he did this was there was a parade that was going on in New York, the New York Parade, and he seated a bunch of reporters beforehand telling them that this group of young women was going to be it was the torches of freedom. They were going to be representing the torches of freedom. Now, this is the post-war era, and it's in the boom, so th there are a lot of contextual things going on here. And the moment struck when they came along in the parade, and he, all these reporters came out, and they, they were, had the cameras ready to take pictures, and at the instant that they were about to take the pictures, every woman in the group pulled out a Lucky Strike cigarette, lit it up, and took a puff out of it. So the next day, on the front page of the news, there was a photo of all these women smoking cigarettes, smoking Lucky Strikes, with the specific headline, Groups of Girls Puff at Cigarettes as a Gesture of Freedom. And overnight, he was able to break the taboo against women smoking in public. The next day, it was considered acceptable because women were already in the women's suffrage and the women's rights movement and began to experience a lot of power. And this changed the society's, uh, society's stigma against it. And also gave Lucky Strikes a lot of business. This is the kind of thing that Ed Bernays was contracted to do. Another interesting example was in, I can't remember when this was, I want to say the 1930s, don't quote me. The velvet manufacturers were facing ruin because nobody was buying velvet. This was probably a depression era then. So th they were trying to figure out how can you revive the velvet fashion in America? And it's, it's really difficult to do that because if everyone is already in a slump, then people are not going to go out and buy things, especially if they view it as vanity and garish. So the solution was they attacked the source. So Bernays uh, got together a group of people to be considered effectively a fashion advisory group, and they went to Lyon, France, which is the home of silk. They contacted a bunch of uh, manufacturers and Parisian contouriers and enlisted them to act on behalf of vel uh, on velvet. So what they would do, they would start, start to create their clothes using velvet, and uh, visited people in Lanvin, Wirth, Agnes, and Papou, and encouraged all these different manufacturers to use velvet in their gowns and hats. And what happened was, after doing this, he arranged for royalty, and uh, like duchesses and grand dukes and whatnot, to start wearing velvet in their clothing. And this hit America, because American women, especially the group that he was trying to target initially, they watch overseas to see what's happening. Paris was long considered, I think it still is, one of, the high, one of the high entry points of fashion. People watch the Parisians to see what they're doing, and in this era, they definitely were. So when they saw all of these Parisians touting this velvet all over the place, American women started to uh, see what was going on. A lot of reporters, a lot of editors of magazines started reflecting the fashion changes in their news, and it was a slow and gradual process. It wasn't overnight like the uh, smoking taboo was, but it, tur it completely overturned the dead fashion industry and uh, made velvet really, really popular. And it completely, it made velvet popular and it overturned the rut. So this is the kind of stuff Ed Bernays did. He also wrote a book called Propaganda, 
which is what the title of this talk is based on. It's excellent. It was published in like 1920, 1930, something like that. I can't remember. But it has a lot of interesting examples of this. And Ed Bernays also delves deep into the psychology. Um, Ed Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew. So I don't know if he fucked his mom, but. <laughs> so, OK, I saw a couple people. What was Dale Carnegie famous for? Okay, he, he wrote the book How to Win Friends and Influence. Sure. Uh, there's a couple of uh, very interesting things about Dale Carnegie, or yeah, Dale Carnegie actually. First off, he actually changed his name to it, it was spelled differently, like N E G E Y or something like that, and he changed the spelling of his name to match that of Andrew Carnegie, the uh, the tycoon, because people are able to recognize that. People already had this built-up image of how Carnegie should be spilled. Further, if they can identify that name, they automatically assume, oh, he must be related. Therefore, or something like that. They just come up with these preconceptions based on the name and the word and what they have set up. So by using that, he was able to actually pull people in and gain credibility. He started a, a class in Manhattan in, pro I want to say, the 1910s or the 1920s, where he was trying to explain some of the tricks that he had used in the past to build up business connections. And like many speakers at Nauticon have, have experienced, it's very difficult to have people to give feedback, right? It's very difficult to engage in discourse unless you actively pursue it on your own. The way he was able to counter this, because the first class he held was going kind of crappy, he started to ask people to vent. What is it that pisses you off about life? What is it that pisses you off about the world? And when they started to do that, they got up and talked about what they were angry with. Nobody wants to hear the good things. Everyone wants to hear the bad. That's why bad PR is so useful. Everyone, the, the class was a hit. People started discoursing. It, all, all kinds of things happened in the class, and people started coming back. Um, so do you know any of the ideas? Does anybody, has anybody read the book? OK. Do you remember any of the ideas, like how you could get somebody to do what you want? And this falls into two very interesting things, actually. Because it's like, how do you get, OK, there's two things. One, how do you talk to somebody, right? And the next is, how do you make them remember you? How do you win them onto your side? So uh, the first one is fairly easy to do. If you're talking with somebody, get them to talk about themselves. If you don't say anything about yourself in a conversation, but they're saying lots, just agree with what they say, and yes, and you become a sycophant almost. But people remember that because it's something they're interested in that they now have a relation with you because of. Um, a couple of interesting examples regarding that. And this pulls into names as well. Um, train stations. How do you get somebody to invest in something that you're working on? Say you want to have a train station built. And this is an example from the book. Well. The easiest way, and it depends on how much uh, you put into a name, you contact the tycoon who is going to invest in you and say, hey, I'm going to name this uh, rail station after you. An interesting example of improving company morale that uh, Carnegie used early on, you had, there was a company that had a day shift and a night shift. So to, he was trying to improve the productivity of them. So, the company produced X number of goods, right? So they produced bushels, and they produced five bushels. So what he did, he got the number of how many bushels the night shift had done, and he wrote the number five down in big words on the floor. So that when people came in for the day shift, they saw that, and they started asking what it's about. And they said, hey, this is how many bushels the night shift produced. And uh, that made people angry. That set two teams against each other. And once you have a healthy competition, then you're going to produce more. So the number turned into this symbol of how good you were, and thus the day crew turned against the night crew. Very interesting social experiment. OK. Citizen Kane. Anybody know why this is important? OK. Where's the sled? It's buried under the newspapers. Citizen Kane's a very interesting story because it deals with perception. The main character of the movie is not in it. He dies before it happens. Or I guess at the very beginning, he dies. But Citizen Kane deals with public perception because we're trying to recreate who this man is out of how others perceive him to be. We're effectively trying to reconstruct 
how a person is based on the different sources, how the news media views him. So whether he's bad or good, it simply depends on how the media portrays him. Has anyone seen Maslow's Hierarchy? Okay. Anyone? Who is? So Maslow's Hierarchy is very interesting because you can actually use this to kind of hone in on what level of marketing you should be doing to somebody. You don't, like, if, if you're a Woody Allen fan, you're probably not going to be attracted to McDonald's ads, is what, what that goes to. And different people who are at different stages in life and different stages of countenance and being are appealed to on different levels, and this is something advertisers take in. Is anybody familiar with uh, Shannon's model of communication? The idea here is that you have a message, right? We have the same message that we're trying to relay. Like, uh, I like cheese. How do I get that to somebody? You put it into words, and everyone views things differently, which is where all these different filters come in, as far as either different languages or different eras or different images attacking somebody with the senses. You have the same message, but you can relay that message in multiple ways. Okay, so fuck that shit. What about identity? Um, why are logos important? Anyone? Right, right. There's actually a very interesting thesis on this called a century of candy bars. Oh, the answer, by the way, was because a logo represents effectively an idea, right? Um, the, th the thesis behind candy bars was looking at the evolution of different... What? Hold on, there's another question. Okay, what do you want... I can, but that goes beyond the scope of this talk. That becomes a very long discussion. Yeah. Um, I strongly recommend researching into it. It's effectively, you have a symbol or a notion, and how do we get that idea from it? How do we communicate? What? Right. And what, and what the difference is is very important. So the history of candy bar wrappers is very interesting because if you make a single change to what is considered the logo, you will destroy the reputation of the candy bar. So for example, you'll see Hershey's candy bars. The logo has stayed effectively the same for all of Hershey's existence. Also introducing new candy bars, Hershey's Crunch Bar, for example. When it was first debuted, Hershey's was big letters so people could recognize that, and then Crunch Bar was little tiny letters. And as the popularity of the Crunch Bar grew, Crunch became a symbol in and of itself, and people were able to re identify and recognize that more. And this, we'll carry this into two more things, flyers and mascots, so. Okay, who doesn't recognize every logo up here? <laughs> so these are some fairly well-known logos. Um, these are fairly definitive. You don't even need text because, you don't even need text or a name because you already know what it is. For those who are mentally retarded, we have Pepsi, McDonald's, Apple, Google, sorry, and then Nike and Windows. What? Oh, Alex, okay, my bad. Oh, okay. Now, okay, a Red Bull goes to whoever can identify all of these logos. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Okay, MySpace. You want a Red Bull? Okay. So can somebody go through one by one and tell me what they are? But he was talking. <laughs> okay. So, what elements make this a good party flyer? <laughs> this was actually a really good party. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Actually, that was a decoy, too. Oh. So you have the title, you have who's playing there, you have the info line, you have the price of it, you have the date, and then who's responsible for it. And those elements work together to make a really good flyer. If you're missing any of those, then it kind of falls apart and people start asking questions. Yeah, how much is this? Yeah, when is it? Here's how a lot of flyers are be being communicated now. I mean, the same information is there. It's just uh, communicated over a different media. So can anybody name all the mascots here? <laughs> <laughs> how do mascots play into this? Why are mascots important? Where's John Draper? Where's John Draper on there? That's Kevin Mitnick. <laughs> I like cereal. I don't know about you guys. Mascots actually uh, help to cr create a sense of community, though. If you're Ron Ronald McDonald and all the hamburger and everything. So you didn't answer the question, why are mascots important? Do you know? Like Dunder Mifflin? <laughs> How many of these mascots have you seen in porn? So now that we have tried to identify who we are, how do we, uh, how do we propagate that data? How do, we, how do we get it around? Twitter. OK, you can do Twitter. How, how, can you, how, how can you transmit information through trade shows? How can you communicate your message through trade shows? Flare. Flare, awesome. Flare is actually very effective because if you have just some pencil of a company lying around, you're going to know what the company name is and thus recognize it the next time you see it. Any other examples? Anyone? Stickers. Stickers, Stickers are a great Swag. example. Swag. OK, strippers are also a very good example. <laughs> Not that I would know. Booth babes. Booth babes rock. Free beverages. Free beverages, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Giving stuff out for free, what does Black Cat do? So how can negative PR work in your favor? Exactly. Twitter was down like half the time, like 50% of the time during its first, month, first six months of existence, right? And yet people know what Twitter is. Twitter goes down, people don't care. MySpace, same thing. MySpace crashes all the time. I don't use it much, but I've heard that it does. It's still based on cold fusion. But why, why, why is the company able to transcend that negative image? It uses a fail whale? <laughs> it puts a friendly face on terrible software engineering. That's actually a good point, because you have the fail whale, which then becomes an internet meme, and people can use that to identify what Twitter is. Um, what about Google's on? Does anybody know this video? There, there was a video, this was a few years back, where they were trying to encapsulate what happens when all the major websites together merge. So you have Google joined with Amazon. What would happen? The singularity. The singularity. <laughs> Keep Kurzweil out of this. <laughs> exactly, right. This, this term comes into what is identity. Is it better for everyone to be able to instantaneously communicate with each other? Or is it better to retain a shred of integrity? Some people consider in identity to be integrity, right? Which is why a lot of people will not use Facebook or won't post on it. Sure can. <laughs> OK. So there's two types of events you can hold, singular and cyclic. Singular is the, the, the second one here, the entry guaranteed without, without uh, out-of-state ID. That's actually used for a lot of parties. 
or a lot of events that you're trying to convince people that, hey, there's going to be so many people here that will guarantee your admission if you bring something to the table, right? If you have an out-of-state idea, you can come to our rave. Free to the first 50 people is something that we used for uh, the CCC Sputnik deployment this past December. Grand opening and going out of business sales are also great because they break people out of the rut and routine of life. And it helps to both initiate and perpetuate things, right? So cyclic would be holiday sales anniversary. Why do places have Christmas sales? What are holidays? Why do we have holidays? So there are two reasons to hold events. It initiates or, perceptu or per perpetuates interest or vibe. It also disrupts boredom of routine. You're doing the same thing every day. Well, if I can go to this, then that actually, I might meet somebody new. I might go to Nauticon instead of going to work. You can, uh, how can you use events to uh, rescue reputation? Like say there's a rumor going around that your company is struggling, your company is like going under. You hold a festival or have some kind of a contest or fair or exposition, people come to it and they start thinking about the contest or exposition rather than the company going under, and eventually they get to the point where they don't feel that, that like you bring up, oh, the company's going under, and they see this, and they're like, well, wait, we're holding contests. That's got to be bullshit. So did any, does anybody not know about the Michael Phelps cannabis controversy? <laughs> not Fred Phelps. That's a different one. No. Yes, it was. Yeah, Michael Phelps was the guy who won like X. What did he win? Six, seven gold medals in the Olympics. He was considered, you know, the height of fame. Okay. Michael Phelps was considered the height of popularity, and then a picture of him showed up in the UK press with a bong. There's no evidence whether he was actually smoking that or not, but overnight, his popularity went upside down. News, so news sources were decrying him, several sponsors pulled up. Now, there are ways to counteract this, but when the deed has been done, it's very difficult to rescue that, but there, which means this does, in fact, go both ways. How does the media affect this? Like, what's the difference between these three media sources? Okay. <laughs> they all cater to a specific demographic, right? But um, is there any that people here prefer? Fox News. Fox News, awesome. So, so based on the channel or media through which information flows, it will be have a different bias, and it will target people of a different demographic. What about the internet? Okay, it's full of assholes. Sure enough, that's why you're on it, right? Um, these, okay, so what do we got here, right? We got MySpace. What does MySpace do? Okay. Whereas WordPress is uh, supposed to be an emblem representing what blogs are. Well, how, how do blogs differ from regular media? <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So the conclusion in theory, assuming that you weren't too distracted by the hecklers, is that people are predictable. Reputation is delicate, but you can manage it. And for concepts to survive, they must evolve. Uh, any questions? <laughs> Fuck you, too. <laughs>